Hey, I'm Ben Marshall, and I'd like to share woodworking tips, tricks, and how-tos every other week on this channel. In this video, I'm gonna share six ways to haul plywood when you own a small car. I'm gonna cover some safer methods for hauling wood with your car and some other alternatives as well. I'm also gonna highlight the most dangerous yet most common way I've seen people haul wood and why you should avoid it. If you wanna see the tools, gear, and setup I use to get seven sheets of plywood in my Toyota Prius, keep watching this video or skip to the end to find out. I've been a woodworker for several years now and have owned my small Toyota Prius for almost a year. There are certainly challenges that come to this combination, but I figured out some good storage techniques to maximize the space in my small car to haul the materials that I need for my projects. If you're limited by your transport capacity, don't let that stop you from building the projects that you want. Before we get into the six methods, I wanted to share some quick considerations before you make a material run for that next project. The first and biggest factor you should consider is safety, not only for yourself, but for others around you as well. Accidents caused by falling debris from a vehicle is a potential risk you take when transporting anything on the outside of your vehicle. According to the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administrations, data collected from accident reports between 2011 and 2014 showed there were approximately 240,000 incidents involving roadway debris. Of those accidents, there were over 47,000 injuries and 124 deaths. In addition to putting other lives at risk and other motors at risk, you could also face legal consequences for hauling materials in an unsafe manner. In most states here in the U.S., you can be fined up to $5,000 for any debris falling from your vehicle, even if it doesn't damage anyone or anything. You can even be fined for having improperly secured materials strapped to the top of your car in some states. You could also be sentenced up to a year in jail. I cannot stress the importance of safety in having properly secured materials to your car. If at all possible, avoid major interstates while transporting material goods, as 67% of reported accidents happen on the highways. A few moments to ensure your tie downs are secure could prevent a life of pain, grief, and agony for yourself or others. The next consideration is how much can you carry safely? Think about the size of your current project or upcoming projects and how they can be adjusted to fit the limitations of your vehicle. A little bit of project planning and space consideration can not only save you money, but the hassle of figuring out more expensive alternative ways to move lumber as well. I'm often surprised at how much material I can fit in my small car with a little bit of forward thinking, ingenuity, and planning around my current restrictions. So I encourage you to really stretch your Tetris mental agility and acuity and figure out a better way to fit those materials inside your small car. Also, you should consider your future aspirations as a woodworker. Is this a long lasting endeavor or just something that you wanna try out for the time being? If this is something that you really enjoy and you wanna continue doing, I highly encourage you to invest in great tools up front. A great set of well-maintained tools in the hands of a skilled woodworker can outlive nearly any vehicle in your lifetime. Great tools are an investment that save you time, frustration, and additional materials. In the years that follow, the money that was spent on cheap tools and other methods I'm about to mention could have been saved up for a truck or larger vehicle that's big enough to haul the project materials that you want to make. For the time being, I'd rather have a great set of tools and an okay vehicle to haul them in rather than a nice truck filled with cheap and ineffective tools. Think about the long-term and the short-term effects of your decisions going forward. Now that we've looked at some key considerations for the available options, let's dig into different ways to haul plywood when all you own is a car. Understand that these are all dependent on your current situation. It's definitely not the end-all be-all, but just points to consider before you start your next project. The first and most riskiest method is to carry plywood or lumber on the top of your vehicle. For my research and the legal advice of other professionals, I do not recommend this method. It has the highest risk of failure and a greater chance of injuring others and damaging property. The roof racks seen on most cars are not capable of handling excessive weight or dynamic forces caused when driving at high speeds. And I won't even speculate on carrying lumber without a roof rack. I recently spoke with a traffic accident attorney on this specific instance, and here's what he had to say. Are there any legal ramifications for strapping a bunch of lumber to the top of my car? Um, well, there sure could be. And in all honesty, it, it really depends on the, the way you go about doing that. Obviously, if something is uh, sticking out front or back, uh, farther away from your vehicle, and uh, it, it extends the length of your vehicle, that could be a hazard. Okay. Um, and somehow, uh, conceivably, I mean, I, in all honesty, I don't know what the cop would charge you with, but conceivably, they could charge you with reckless driving, and that is a criminal offense. So you want to be very careful about uh, how you go about doing that to make sure that it's lashed down securely. Uh, and then it doesn't, you know, protrude front, back, or sides um, from your vehicle. You know, essentially, 
extend the uh, length of my vehicle. Lengthening the danger zone. Okay, there is a particular statute that says no vehicle shall be operated or moved on any highway unless it is so constructed, maintained, and loaded as to prevent its contents from dropping, sifting, leaking, or otherwise yeah. escaping. Have you seen a lot of instances where there was damage to either uh, property or persons because somebody didn't have a secured load? A client once who was actually killed uh, oh my by a, a truck um, rear-ending him, and that wasn't bad enough. The, uh, some of the metal bars that the truck was carrying shot forward and you know smashed through the car, and that's what actually Jeez. killed my client. So Jeez. I have seen that. I mean, if somebody uh, is injured by something that flies off your vehicle or that you know somehow uh, damages them, you'd be personally responsible for every bit of the damage that was it was caused. And that, oh, absolutely. that's not a law, that's just a principle. I mean, if you cause damage, you, you have to stand good for it. So. Given the legal consequences for potential danger, I hope you don't or no longer use this method of transporting materials. However, if you do, remember to stay off the highways and stick to lower speed limit roadways to reduce the chances of roadway debris. If you want to know more about roadway debris and what you can do to prevent it, check the descriptions below for additional links to the sources I use for this video. The second method of moving plywood is to borrow a truck or large vehicle from a friend, coworker, or family member. Using someone else's vehicle takes away the costs and risks associated and other points in this list. Depending on the truck bed size that you use, you can move most sheet goods and lumbers without having to reduce dimensions. Using anchor points found in most truck beds gives you the option to securely fasten your materials. However, this method can soon wear out. It's welcome and you're not only borrowing a person's vehicle, but their time as well. Now, depending on the person, this might not be the best option to use every single time, but rather here and there. You could easily annoy or irritate someone if you consistently ask to use their vehicle. Offering a compensation for any inconvenience your request may cause is a great way to stay in their graces. As a woodworker, this should be an easy thing for you to figure out. If you have a friend or family member that is willing to invest their services in your endeavor, then by all means continue using this method. Method number three is renting a vehicle. Whether you rent a vehicle from your supplier or you rent one from a rental agency, it's a great way to transport project materials when you can't move materials with your own vehicle. And it's useful for whenever buying materials in bulk. Purchasing by bulk materials reduces the frequency and the time to pick up on more frequent trips. However, this is only feasible if you have planned out sequential projects in the weeks or months to come. You can rent most trucks daily for a small fee and then pay for every mile driven thereafter. The cost effectiveness of this method dwindles if your mileage is high and your material volume is low. To save more, you need to buy more within a single purchase. The fourth method is to have materials delivered directly to your shop or home. This is a paid service that most big box stores have, as well as some other online retailers. This is typically more costly than renting a truck, however, depending on your area and the volume of materials needed, it could be more cost efficient. Depending on your current situation, this may be a blind order. Unless you're using a proven and known dealer, it's kind of a roll of the dice on the material quality and you won't be able to inspect until it's being delivered. The fifth method is to outfit your car with a small trailer. Hauling materials behind your car in a trailer is a viable, if a bit costly, option. You can purchase a folding utility trailer big enough to haul full sheets of plywood. They typically start at a price around $350 and go up from there. If your car doesn't have a factory hitch installed, there are plenty of hitch kits available on the market. Just make sure you check your local laws as you may need special permits or licensing to pull a trailer behind a car. The only drawbacks to this method, apart from the associated costs, is maintaining the equipment to keep up with it operating safely. Speaking of safety, let's talk about my last method on this list. The final method, which I think is the best when you own your own car, is to break down your material goods on site and transport them inside your vehicle. It is the safest way to transport materials when using a car in the way that I do it every single time. In my woodworking experience over the years, most plywood project materials at final or rough cut dimensions can fit within a small car. Another option is to have your supplier rough cut the materials for you. At most big box stores and supply dealers, there are cut stations to dimension down lumber. However, it's dependent on an employee being present to operate it, and that's if the equipment works at all. I've made numerous pieces of furniture over the last few months, including beds, bookshelves, desks, nightstands, all without the need to carry lumber externally. There are always exceptions. However, I feel that if dimension materials cannot fit, the designs can be adjusted to accommodate the size restrictions that you currently face. Out of all the methods I'm mentioning today, breaking down your materials at your material supplier is the most sustainable and cost-effective method based on long-term spending and overall safety. I like to consider that I only have to buy most tools once. 
Other methods require me to pay for services or continual use. I'd much rather put the money up front for quality rather than have to string along tools that are cheap in price and performance. No matter what vehicle I use or own, I will always have a need for the tools I mentioned later in this video. I will likely have these tools longer than any vehicles I may have in the next decade. Buying these tools first would be my recommendation to anyone who's committing themselves and their wallets to lifelong woodworking. As I mentioned in the beginning of this video, I want to provide an overview of the tools, equipment, and setup I take with me when breaking down materials before loading them into my car. Keep in mind that this is not about convenience, but safety. I would much rather spend a little bit of time dimensioning my lumber to fit inside my car rather than put other lives at risk by hauling it on top of my car. Although the tools I have are considered on the high end, there are other tool manufacturers that sell similar products for less. I'm also providing affiliate links to the tools that I use and own, as well as some other alternatives. I feel that it's really important that before you go anywhere mobile that you always check to make sure that you have all the tools and equipment that you need. So that way when you show up on site, you're not having to rummage or you're not having to come all the way back to find or uh, retrieve the, the equipment that you're looking for. So a quick overview of the things that I take with me whenever I go to the lumber supplier to break down my goods. The first thing that uh, I grab is the track saw. I have the TS-75 or the Festool TS-75. It doesn't really matter which track saw you have. Track saws add uh, a accuracy and repeatability capability that a circular saw just doesn't have. Most track saws are for fine woodworking and so it's not as aggressive as a traditional carpenter saw. However, you are going to get fantastic and clean cuts whenever you use a track saw. The next piece of uh, equipment that I take with me is, is a track or a guide rail. I have two uh, guide rails here. I have two guide rail connectors and so whenever I show up on site and I'm able to connect these together and allows me to break uh, or rip down a full plywood sheet. The next gear that I take with me are my track parallel guides. Okay, uh, Because I'm not doing narrow rips, I'm only doing wide rips, uh, I can take just these ends. I don't have to take the extension guides. There are lots of different companies that make parallel guides. If you want to find out a little bit more information about them, you can click on the video up here. Uh, that was my previous video, Parallel Guides. So these are, the, these are the probably the main components that you want to have with you. The track saw, the guides, and the parallel guides. Everything else here is kind of an added bonus with the exception of the sacrificial boards here. This is just traditional panel insulation that you can buy in most big box stores. They come in all different uh, thicknesses. I just grabbed the one that was available. You can grab them thinner. All it does is it helps support your workpiece. I grabbed a thick piece because it adds rigidity to whatever surface I'm laying the plywood down on and it prevents it from bowing or dipping whenever I'm running with the track saw. And it, it helps support the fiber underneath that you're cutting so that way you have less chance of, uh, of a tear out or a blowout with your um, wood fibers on the opposite side of your plywood. The next is safety equipment. Eye protection and ear protection, it's vital. The next is my notepad with my cut list on it and a good marker or a, a dry marker, pencil, fine lead pencil, just a way for you to mark your measurements before you make your rips and cuts. I have, also have a uh, tape measure. Some additional things that you can take, these are not necessary. However, after doing this a lot, uh, I found that having these readily available or taking them with me really helps with my process and makes it a lot easier. I take some three-way clamps and this is so that I can gang rip plywood. So I can put two or three sheets of plywood down if they're going to take uh, identical rips. I can clamp these at either end and it just holds the plywood together. So as I'm laying my track and I'm moving around, it, they don't move around on me. The next one is the Jira 16 PE from TSO. This is a uh, guide rail square and so it's really awesome. It slides onto the guide rail, it clamps down and it gives you a perfectly 90 degree reference on your track saw. So if you did want to do cross cuts uh, on site in order to put them in your car, this is a must for you. Uh, it is a lifesaver. It's perfectly square. It's a machined uh, hardened aluminum. I use it to, to make sure that all the pieces in my uh, all the tools in my shop are square. Really good piece of kit and definitely worth the investment. 
The last thing I like to take with me is just a small container. It doesn't have to be a sustainer. It just helps me keep all these little small pieces um, together and uh, not able to lose them on route. The thing that I forgot that's very important is just a small screwdriver, and that's so that whenever you screw the rail connectors together, at least for the Festool ones, uh, I can screw them and unscrew them together. I can break them down and it fits easier in my car. So once I, I have everything, I, I check to make sure that everything's working properly. I make sure that uh, there's nothing that I additional that I might need to break down the sheet goods. Now I'm gonna load this up into my car and then head to my dealer. In this video, I pointed out several methods you can use to haul project materials even though you own a car. Your results are only limited by your abilities to problem solve and think critically. Remember that however you decide to transfer materials, make sure that it is done in a safe and responsible manner. If you found this video helpful, give it a like. If you want to see more content on this channel, consider subscribing. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.